Brent from the Hawaii Cannabis Organization. We are incredibly fortunate to have with us Carl Olson from a group that he founded in 1990 called Iowans for Medical Marijuana. Carl's early efforts in medical and religious freedom to use um, and in fact heal from diseases like epilepsy have produced results. And Carl's efforts may have their largest impacts to come actually. Carl's partnered with state legislators, medical boards, physicians, and moms to usher in a new wave of medical access in Iowa through what is called a federal exemption for medical cannabis use. And that work um, will be front and center here coming up at the beginning of the year. On November 7th, Carl's going to present his insights and actions that are making this possible for Iowans and how Hawaii can benefit from this knowledge. Uh, this uh, presentation will be during our Can Shift event. Again, that's November 7th. Um, be sure and check out the uh, event page at hawaiicannabis.org slash can shift to get the latest times um, for each of the present, uh, presentations. It's a free event um, thanks to the generous donation of our presenters like Carl. And we're extremely grateful to have Carl with us now. Aloha, Carl. Mahalo nui for joining us today and for helping folks understand what your presentation means for their participation on November 7th. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, good morning, Brent, or good afternoon, whichever it is. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, I guess we're on a five-hour time difference, and still, still a little bit of morning left here. Um, can, can you tell us a little bit about the, the title and your presentation and what folks can expect to, to learn from the, their, their time on, at the event? Yeah, I've been watching states legalize marijuana for this and that, you know, medical and recreational, and I've been wondering why nobody has tackled the federal issue other than to make these um, ineffective attempts to have marijuana reclassified. Um, because the, accepted, the, st the federal statute says accepted medical use in the United States, and so accepted medical use in a state is a state law that says it's medicine that there isn't any greater evidence that something has been accepted if there's a law that says it's medicine then that's accepted in that state and in the united states do, doesn't mean in every state it means any state so i've been watching this go by and nobody's been making these kinds of arguments and um, so I've been complaining about it and finally got my opportunity here in Iowa in 2017. We enacted a, a possession only law in 2014, but I didn't want to um, bring up the issue there because that was such small potatoes that nobody would believe there was a serious federal threat. So when Iowa decided to start growing, manufacturing the cannabis and selling it over the counter retail, that's when I decided to to make my move. So retail sales began here December of 19 of 2018 and I filed a petition with the DEA for federal exemption under 21 CFR 1307.03 in January of 2019 and then I presented that to the state legislators and said you should do this not me. This should be the state of Iowa telling the federal government that we're exempt. And then I went to the Department of Health and showed it to them. And the legislators actually responded to it fairly well. They, they seemed to like it. So then I presented it to the Medical Cannabidiol Board, which is our Cannabis Advisory Board, which is, um, I think, seven doctors and a police captain. And they liked it. And they said, how come nobody else has done this? And I said, I can't explain that. I've been... Uh, talking about this and, and uh, I seem to be the only one that's willing to uh, bring it up. So I'm bringing it up. And they said, well, I said, if there's a way that we could reconcile state and federal law, why would we not do that? Why would we want to just intentionally cause chaos if there's a way that we could reconcile these two and bring the two in alignment? And they said, that makes a whole lot of sense. They're doctors, you know, so they're trying to do no harm and all this stuff. So and they know all about federal regulation. They know, like, I mean, they're the most heavily regulated profession on the planet, probably. So they, they understood the argument, which I kind of thought they would. 
and they voted unanimously to recommend to the state file for this exemption. And so when I say I filed my own petition in January 2019, I wouldn't recommend anyone do that unless they're going to use it as a tool like I did to get the state to do it, because it's really the responsibility of the state. If the state enacts a law that is being considered inconsistent with federal law, and there's some way that it could be consistent with federal law, then the state has an obligation to continue to uh, perfect that and make it whole so that it's not quasi legal, that it's 100% fully legal under both state and federal law. So they understood that and they made that recommendation and then they put it in their annual report to the legislature in uh, January of this year. And it surfaced in two bills, one in the House and the Senate, and it was worded that uh, this department would seek federal funding guarantees for the um, use of cannabis in schools and healthcare facilities in Iowa. Uh, they were being threatened with losing their federal funding for allowing the use of cannabis in a healthcare facility or an educational institution. And the department looked at that and September 4th, about a month ago, they said the only clear path forward to get these federal funding guarantees was to get an exemption under 21 CFR 1307.03. And they said the, you know, the path that I had been recommending and they adopted that as state policy. And they're going to review that on November 13th. So your conference is November 7th, our conference. And so like just a few days after that, the, the uh, Medical Cannabidiol Advisory Board is going to review what the state is gonna to submit to the DEA. And of course, my petition is already pending with the DEA and my US Senator is in contact with the DEA. And so, we have communication going on between my US Senator and the DEA, and they know that the state is joining on to this. So uh, all of that communication is taking place. And then the state is gonna file this sometime before the end of December because they wanna put it in their annual report to the legislature saying, this is the final, all the other stuff we implemented by administrative rule, but this piece here, required us to do something that wasn't an administrative rule. So here's the petition that we're filing with the DEA. And then they can say that completes everything we've implemented, all the changes you made to the law in 2020. And they will, so I know they're gonna do this because they wanna put it in that annual report as the capstone as the, well, capstone, the final piece of the, uh, to me it's the capstone, but whatever, <laughs> you know. So that, that is how it's all playing out here. And the way this could help Hawaii is that um, if another state is doing this, that would be more newsworthy than me filing a petition uh, without that confirmation from the state that, yeah, he's, he's right, you know, we have to do this. Um, and then I would say all the states have to do this. What do they want to have laws that are inconsistent with federal law when they don't have to be like, that's crazy. Why would a state legislature? Now I realize a lot of this was done by ballot initiative. That's a little different. Uh, we don't have ballot initiative here in Iowa. So I had to work with the legislators and the department, the, the executive branch the whole entire time. So now they're not being blindsided by this. They know what's going on and they're ready for it. If you did it by ballot initiative, I'm not sure how you would bring the state legislators and the state executive branch up to speed um, when they just get blindsided with it. And they may not have expected the ballot initiative to pass or I, I suppose that's probably not realistic. They probably would. We don't have ballot initiatives, so I don't know how that works. I suppose they would have paid attention to what's on the ballot and tried to figure out what they would do if something like that passed. But um, this should be a, presented to legislators and executive branch as a point of pride, like uh, professionalism. Like, do you want to do sloppy work or high quality work? Right, right. Yeah, so, we don't have ballot initiative either. So uh, it's, it's, it's an uphill battle. Um, well, no, it's, it's not. Look how well it worked without the ballot initiative. Now, I, of course, Without California doing this by ballot initiative at the beginning, 
then I'm not sure we would have any of this. So I don't want to say that's not part of it. Well, but, well, thank you for that. And, and thank you for that optimism. And, and thank you for lighting the path. You know, it's, it's very clear, you know, the way that you're articulating what you're doing and the comparison between the two states without us having a ballot initiative uh, is, is incredibly helpful. And, and I think anyone that watches your presentation on November 7th, we're really going to get a lot out of this, whether they're a legislator or some key decision maker, our dispensary operators, investors will certainly get a lot out of this. Uh, they don't want to operate in a quasi legal fashion. You know, they, uh, they have a, a lot of regulations that they deal with. So, um, I imagine this might help on everything from taxes to access to medicine um, from the patients that they serve. Yeah, uh, I didn't even mention that because it wasn't uh, something that the board um, wanted to focus on. Um, when the when the mothers with the children with epilepsy and the people with PTSD and the different people that um, and fathers and when they came and talked to the board. They didn't tell the board that the tax was exorbitant and that that cost was being passed down to the consumer. They just said, my kid isn't being allowed to use this in school or my elderly parents aren't being able to use this in the nursing home. Um, so they didn't have that sophistication to come in and talk about the federal tax penalty under IRS code section 280E. But that increases the cost of doing business exponentially and that cost is passed down to the patient and so they don't even know how bad they're being hurt but that that is definitely another aspect of it that is huge and, and the other thing is well and and then comes the stigma like how are you going to get legitimate businesses involved in cannabis if they have to sign federal tax papers saying i'm a federal criminal i'm running a continuing criminal enterprise and i cannot not take deductions for these expenses because federal tax code section 280e says if you're running an illegal drug business you can't take this deduction they have to actually sign they're incriminating themselves on their tax returns right. and it's like you'll never get legitimate businesses to agree to get involved in this so it's like it just it's it's stunting the whole entire thing um so that and that just patients don't even realize how bad they're being hurt because they're going from being like do you want 100 lashes or 99 and they're going well 99 sounds better you know <laughs> they they don't know there's any possibility of getting rid of the all 100 lashes you know what i mean right, so, right. yeah so and that's hard to conceive like you were just thinking the best you could do would be 99 and now all of a sudden it's like well there could be zero like wow that that just that's hard to wrap your head around but that's the reality of it well thank you for that and and uh you know i, I don't want to give away too much but i know that you've got a lot more in store for us on november 7th and um you know i i just as humbly as i can be i just deeply deeply appreciate your time not not just for our event but what you've done in iowa and what you've done you know consulting with some of our doctors here and um, really, really reaching out to other states to make this happen. And, and let's hope um, that 2021 will produce uh, some of these impacts across other states where, you know, they may just not have known well, what was possible. All the international treaties have exemption clauses in them too. So this is an end to end solution, state, federal, international, it covers all of it. So, the reason I'm reaching out is because this is a universal thing, you know, and if it's not universal, then it's not right. Thank you for that. Yeah, I agree. And I, I know patients agree there. I, I've never met a patient that wants to operate under some kind of a quasi legal situation. You know, they just yeah. health care. Yep. But that school thing and that healthcare facility thing really bring it home to a lot of these people because the people, we have a really restrictive program, so only the most vulnerable people can even get into it. And so they're heavily impacted by these crazy restrictions on, on uh, 
federal spending, anything that's federally funded. Now they'll tell them, oh, drug-free workplace, you know. Right, right. You're out. Housing, you know. Yeah. Kids are using Ritalin and Adderall and, you know, who knows what else with, with no problem at all in school. So Yeah, yeah, they're being driven toward dangerous pharmaceuticals, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I don't want to hold you up too much today. I, I could talk for hours with you, and I, I hope to... Me too, yeah. Hope to be able to do that. And really looking forward to your presentation, November 7th. Um, folks can get more information at hawaiicannabis.org uh, slash can shift. It's also on our homepage. And can you, uh, can you tell us what the best way would be for folks to contact you if they should have questions uh, before November 7th or after November 7th? Uh, my email address is the best way, Carl, C-A-R-L, at Carl hyphen Olson, O-L-S-E-N dot com. That's O-L-E-O-L-S-E-N dot com. Yeah, yeah. And I also have a website, Iowa Medical Marijuana dot O-R-G. It's kind of long. That's why I didn't give that out. But there's a contact page there with a form on it that will also uh, generate an email that goes to me. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, well, thank you so much for, for giving us some insights into what your presentation is going to be about. Thank you for every single minute we spent together today and really looking forward to having you on our uh, event on November 7th. Um, thanks, Carl. Really appreciate you. Yeah. Thank you, Brett. I'll talk to you on the 7th. All right. Aloha. Aloha. Okay. All right. That should do it. Wow. Get back to work.